Okay. This is Stacy Krim with David Gwynn conducting an oral history for the Pride of the Community project. Today is May 4th, 2021. Uh, can you please state your name and your pronouns? My name is Sata Prescott and my pronouns are he, they, or any neo pronoun that indicates gender neutrality. All right, thank you for speaking with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Where are you from originally? I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and have lived and grown up in many of the Southern United States, the Southeastern United States, principally North Carolina and Virginia, uh, and currently live in uh, Northern Illinois. All right. Did you like attend high school in North Carolina? I attended high school in Virginia in a very small town named Marion, one of the 36, I think, Marions in the United States, um, possibly the smallest, um, which if you include the uh, mental facility and prison population, the entire county has about 30,000 people. And um, were you a part or can you speak to the LGBTQ movement in your high school? Certainly, uh, I was it. Um, so it was a very small town in the late 90s and early 2000s during you know, a tumultuous time for queer rights and representation. Um, I, I experienced a lot of discrimination for being an atypical and non-gender conforming person, um, apparently, female. Um, no one was an out uh, queer person of any description, um, though I was one of the presumed queer people. I'm, I'm not particularly um, integratable into standard uh, heteronormative culture, shall we say. Um, I didn't identify as any particular identity in high school because I didn't have names for what I was. Um, I just considered myself asexual um, in a time before that was like a codified identity. It was just a adjectival descriptor. Um, but it was presumed that I uh, ran a lesbian cabal. Um, that is, I had two female friends that were highly desirable on the dating market, and clearly the reason that they did not date any of the eligible male folk around was that I controlled them with my queer wiles. Um, it was not a healthy place to be. Um, I was at one point locked in a basement. I, I was literally kidnapped by a local... Um, church and held in a basement until I promised to give my soul to the blood of the baby Jesus. Um, it was just, it, it wasn't great. Yeah, that, that it was, it was not a fun place. Um, so again, I didn't think of myself as a queer person at that time, but I still experienced the discrimination that I later came to understand to be, you know, homophobia and transphobia. What denomination was that church? A uh, creepy Baptist, I believe, um, in the sense that in the Appalachian Mountains and in southeastern United States, there's obviously like religion is important, but in the mountains, there's lots of little individual churches that are very culty and might be officially labeled something like Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or whatever, but their individual practices are very insular and unique. Um, they'll typically be like on a back road and they'll have like a reclaimed wood set of three crosses sitting outside with barbed wire around them. It, it's backwoods creepy church. And there were a lot of these in Marion. I think the one that got me was called Calvary Baptist. And were your parents aware that happened? By the time I came back, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to say, yes, I'm saved. Let me go. And they 
they did eventually let me go after extracting a promise to come to their services for youth, which I never fulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, how long did they keep you? Uh, about three hours or so. They, they also kind of kidnapped me from my home. My, my house was right beside a community playground. So I would go to the playground and the church would bring a busload of indoctrinated kids. And they'd say, hey, do you want to come to the next place for games and brownies? And I'm like, I, yes, I would love to go with all of my fellow kids for games and brownies in my small town. Well, I'm sorry you had to endure that. Eh, it was a long time ago. When did you feel that you kind of found your tribe? Definitely college in my first semester of going to Virginia Commonwealth University. I went to a um, LGBT mixer for Halloween where I found all of my friends instantly. Um, by that time, I was sort of dating the person who is now my spouse. Um, I still didn't have any real good sense of, you know, those, those identities. Um, by that time, I knew I wasn't asexual at least. Uh, <laughs> but I still didn't consider myself part of a group or community yet because I hadn't had a group or community. But you put, you know, a few thousand people together uh, in college and with permissivity and boom, there's a bunch of queer people all gathered together in one room. And I'm like, oh, you, you have had these experiences too? Or you've had analogous experiences, but in a different locale? And it was delightful and exciting. Um, I, I did that thing that some college kids do where they um, freak out in their first semester of college. Um, while I didn't do too terribly in all of my classes, I definitely did more poorly than I ever had before um, because I had a mixture of terror and anxiety at becoming an independent person, and so I wouldn't leave my dorm. Or I would stay out all night wandering the streets of Richmond, Virginia with friends talking about deep topics, you know, freshman deep topics. Um, so I did not fulfill the requirements of my scholarship, so I did not get to return to college the next semester. Also, my mother went insane. So I had to leave school um, after one semester and come back home to where my mother had lost her mind. And it, that was also not good. I had to go back to Marion after being not in Marion for a period of time. And it was even worse than I could ever imagine. Uh, about what year was that? See, I graduated high school in 2003, so it would have been the start of 2004. Okay. And how long did you have to stay back in Marion? I think it was sometime shortly after that that I moved into my now spouse, Kat. Uh, Kat is my spouse. And so I moved in with Kat and his family, um, which was also not good, but they lived in the city of Bristol, which is a city that is half in Virginia and half in Tennessee. And is it was the closest actual city, but it's still a shithole, if I may be so blunt. Um, it, it has issues of poverty and uh, white supremacy like whoa um, it's it's I think it's most well known for having a race track and so its economy is almost entirely built around two races a year and so it's not healthy or bustling really it may have changed since I was last there but while I was there it was a dreadful place um, and Kat's parents were 
you know, horrifically abusive. But it was a different kind of bad than my home. So, um, and I think I lived with them for, you know, time is really fuzzy for me at that time. Um, it feels like it was long, but it couldn't have been more than a month or two. Um, and so I, I moved up to Delaware with them when they went on a really ill-advised move to Delaware. And after hitting rock bottom financially there and not being able to get a job, I moved back to Marion with my parents and became a housekeeper at Virginia Tech uh, where my father worked. So that's like a three hour commute every day to be at work by 4 a.m. to clean poop and watch other people being able to have access to education. So it was a deeply unhappy time. Uh, and again, no community. So no friends. Uh, um, Paramore in Delaware, me in Virginia, just absolutely vile. And my mother in and out of institutions. And all the time, both of them telling me about my decisions being very, very bad. They were, don't get me wrong, my decisions were terrible because I was a 19 year old. Uh, but it's also hard to hear it from people who are periodically institutionalized. Not that, not that seeking you know, mental health care is bad, but it's just a complex web of judgment and bad feelings. So it uh, sounds like you had cat through all of this. Uh, did you, because you had met cat in Virginia? Yes, uh, yes. So uh, was he a good support network for you? No, because he was also a young person and an idiot and making bad decisions and had his own family problems. We called each other frequently. We cried a lot. It was very dramatic. Like looking back on it, I roll my eyes in embarrassment, but living in it, it was the end and absolute strife that could ever be. Uh, boy, were we wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, so eventually, we uh, decided that uh, we needed to get out from under our parents' you know, terrible thumbs. Um, him with his abusive family, like very abusive beatings, uh, threatens of suicide and murder, very bad. And my family, which was better, like they, they like showed active love, but they were dealing with problems as well. Um, so I was able to save up enough to move out to an apartment so I wouldn't have to make the commute in to be there by 4 a.m. I would just have to walk to my work. Um, and then Kat was supposed to come down and job hunt. And Kat brought one suitcase of interview clothes for summer. And then I lost my job for being gay. A coworker saw me on a bus in a different town on like the public transit system that was connected via uh, the bus system in a different town in in not my uniform no name tag holding hands on a bus and two days later I was called into my supervisor's office where I was told that my behavior both on and off campus represented the university and I had been seen behaving inappropriately uh, so I was dismissed from work 
And because I was within a year of employment, uh, there was a clause of employment with Virginia Tech that you could be dismissed for any reason, no, nothing guaranteed. Um, and it's also a, an at-will employment state, but additionally, they'd set this up so that you could be tossed. I don't know the legality of it at this point, um, but they were definitely using it as a get out of discrimination laws free card. Um, I, I did in fact go to human resources to make complaint uh, and campaign for myself. And at human resources, the person I talked to agreed that it was clearly discrimination. Like the, the notes and um, information they had uh, also led her to believe it was clearly discriminatory but that I had no recourse because I was within the year of employment. So suddenly uh, I'm unemployed with no savings. Um, my uh, partner has no clothes, no medicine, and I have a lease on an apartment that I could just afford. Um, and so begins about a year of truly intense poverty. Um, so we have no support structures. Uh, theoretically, I could go back to my parents, but Kat was not welcome there because my parents viewed Kat as the reason why their good kid had become so bad. And um, Cat could not go back to his parents because there was a genuine chance of actual murder, death, bad stuff. Um, so that was very, very upsetting and bad. I still had like a good relationship with my father who worked at Virginia Tech and he would come by periodically and drop off food. Um, and we had started, I wrote to all of my college friends, my queer support system that had existed. Um, and this is before like lots of social media, like MySpace existed. Facebook was still restricted to college, but I, I, I didn't have one and I wasn't in college anymore. So I couldn't get one. Um, but I was able to email my friends and say, this terrible thing has happened. Please send me food. And so they took all of the um, you know, oatmeal packets, like instant oatmeal, and all of the chips they could on their um, free passes or their, their meal passes to on-campus dining. And so they mailed me a huge box of non-perishable foods that we were able to live off of for a good long while. Um, they didn't have money either, so they couldn't send us money. Um, but that kindness, I, I will never, ever forget. We would not have made it without, um, you know, people literally sending us food. But shortly after that, my spouse's drugs had run out. Um, and Kat has a very intense asthma, like, has literally been in textbooks as extreme case study asthma, was in and out of um, hospitals throughout childhood and had just sort of gotten it under control with, um, you know, we'll say abuse of steroids. So we called the insurance company to try and get the medication approved, but Kat was no longer on the insurance because the father had lost the job that they went to Delaware for um, and Kat no longer lived in the household. So any next job couldn't be put on the insurance, even though we were still under the then lower threshold of I think 22, 23, something like that. Or, or maybe, maybe it was just 20. In any case, we were still under it at the time 
But I remember being on the phone with an insurance company and you know, crying and crying that, you know, if we can't get this medication that costs $900 every month out of pocket, um, bad things will happen. And they just said no. And we didn't have $900 out of pocket. And so within the first year of us living together, about a month after the phone call, and you know, Kat has been getting worse and worse and worse, like breathing wise. Um, there's a day it gets, it starts getting really bad. And we've been staying up all through the night, you know, trying to watch Kat's breathing, using the nebulizer. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to watch over him while he gets what sleep he can. Um, for, for asthma, coffee sometimes helps, right? So he's been downing coffee for days and so he's not really sleeping. Um, so I'm, I've, I've just started working at a Burger King. Um, and so I call up my, well, so first I, we have a long conversation about what to do because we know that if he goes to the hospital, we're, we're ruined from our, you know, um, precarious position financially. Um, our, the Burger King work is just enough to cover rent and electricity, and that is it. Um, luckily, water's included, so we don't have internet. We don't have a phone. Um, we have a free track phone that we can use to dial 911, and that's all. Sometimes we're given a gift of like a minutes card. Um, and, and throughout the summer, we were able to go down to the farmer's market and get the tossed aside stuff from farmers. So like, that's how we're making it. So going to the hospital and accruing a hospital bill, we just see as the end, the absolute end. Um, but once Kat's lips turn blue and he can't function anymore, I make the decision that we have to go. It's at death or no money and death is bad. So I call up my Burger King manager in the middle of the night and I beg for a ride to the hospital uh, because the bus system has ended and I can't afford a taxi. So he comes out um, and I'm able to get Cat. I'm able to heft Cat into the hospital so we don't have to pay for an ambulance. Um, and by the time he gets to the hospital, there's nothing left. They, they hook him up and I'm telling them what's wrong and what they need to do before they actually get a doctor in to prescribe the various things. Like I'm, uh, because by now I know the medical regimen. And even so, he ends up in a coma for three weeks. And then in recovery, well, for in hospital recovery for another three weeks or so. Sorry, this is taking so long to explain. Um, Take as much time as you So while he's in recovery, where, while he's awake, uh, the hospital damages him because they move him to another bed and they end up twisting his leg. Um, and he's never recovered from that. We tried to do malpractice suit, but nobody would take our case. We had no money to hire a lawyer. <laughs> Poverty is rough. <laughs> uh, while he was in a coma, I visited every night. When my father got off work with Virginia Tech, he'd drive me over to the hospital um, and I'd put the air conditioning back down to 60 because they kept raising it and thinking that they were doing good. It was a bad hospital, um, but I would read from Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's Good Omens, because that's the book we were reading to each other before he went under. 
So I finished reading the book to him while he was unconscious. Uh, and then when he woke up again, we read it back to each other from where he remembered it being. Um, I still have a diary from that time, I think. So maybe I'll send you that if you want it. <laughs> uh, um, it's mostly a teenager moaning very sad, very sadly. Um, I, I think you are entitled to that judging from your story. <laughs> Uh, so eventually Kat gets to come back home, and by this time, I've picked up another job at Virginia Tech as a housekeeper in a different part of the campus. I was hired by a lesbian who was in charge of that housekeeping department, and she told me that, of course, she looked and saw that I had been employed previously, so she called up my old supervisor and said, hey, why was this person let go? My old supervisor said, well, their performance was excellent, the best we'd ever had. Uh, but, well, she had this friend. <laughs> and so the lesbian, understanding this to be, uh-huh, instantly hired me. Uh, so I deeply appreciate her for all time. Incidentally, the person who hired us at Burger King was also a lesbian. So I can definitely say, uh, I, uh, yay lesbians. Um, they are the only reasons we did not starve to death. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was our early time together living in Blacksburg, Virginia, just sort of a parade of hell and misfortune. Um, So at what point did you decide to go back to school? My grandmother decided for me. She decided that no scion of hers would be an illiterate poor. Uh, she was an old southerner of Tennessee extraction and she was the intellectual um, pillar of Marion, Virginia. She was the English teacher in the high school and everyone had been taught by Mrs. Earp and she was the best person ever. And so I was not to be her white trash legacy. So she said that if I came and lived in a house she owned and Kat could come too. And she would pay for my schooling. Then I said, okay, yes. I leapt at the chance. Um, this meant that Kat had to live indoors for two years and not be seen by the community. Uh, she gave me a car. Kat was not permitted to be in it. Uh, she, she let me drive her car. Um, the community was not to know about my filthy little secret. And Kat and I agreed as it was the only way we were getting out of drowning in uh, Blacksburg. And she would periodically come to the house and abuse Kat uh, verbally, mentally, emotionally. Um, in addition to the uh, Jews in the Attic experience, um, which wasn't just for Kat, um, my friend, our friend Deirdre, who had also been a person that we befriended in Blacksburg, and who had brought us food periodically. Um, so an, another like deeply beloved friend um, is a black person. And she came to visit us once by riding in the back of my father's car, leaning down so she didn't get harassment from the mountain people. And she would come over to the house like once every six months-ish. And when my grandmother was coming, she and Kat would run upstairs, or limp as the case may be, um, and hide and try to be very, very quiet so that my grandmother wouldn't have to know of their existence. Um, was... Hoy. So I finished my associate's degree, improved my grades enough to reapply to VCU where I was let in, but I could not regain my good grade scholarship. Um, 
So we moved out to Richmond. Uh, I got a job at the Barnes and Noble on campus. That was the official college bookstore. Um, and I made enough money to cover um, our basic living expenses. And Kat was able to file for and receive disability. And that standardized income kept us independent. And I no longer had to accept money from my grandmother. So that I think was the start of our real life together. Um, and once again, while on campus, um, more working at the bookstore than in any of my classes, I made a close cadre of queer friends. So, um, and as I was back in Richmond, all of my old friends who by now had graduated VCU uh, were still around. And so I had that support system again. So we were poor, but like normal poor, like occasionally late on the bills poor, or, you know, you don't have any luxuries poor. Um, we lived in a crappy apartment uh, that periodically flooded and was full of crickets. We called it the bucket. Um, ivy literally grew in into the house from the outside through the wall. Oh, wait, that, that was a different apartment. Dang it. Whatever. It was a series of bad apartments. Doesn't matter. Um, but, but I would still say that Richmond was a much better life than even having house, car, and food provided by an evil woman. Oh. And as you were integrating uh, back into LGBTQ culture in Richmond, um, did you have any changes in understanding of your identity? Yes. Um, by this time, I had figured out that I was not internally misogynistic. Um, I was trans. Um, I, it took a lot of work to figure out that I definitely didn't hate women. Um, but I wanted to make sure of that first, you know, you know am I really trans or have I just ingested societal misogyny? Um, because I definitely knew that the sexism is real. Um, and I had had a lot of bad experiences with trans men and trans women who were gatekeepery and told me I definitely wasn't trans. I wasn't trans enough. Um, like I, I used to do conventions, like nerd conventions, mostly anime or science fiction. And I'd meet a lot of queer and trans people there. And, you know, they would be these glorious bedecked costumed beings that made my heart flutter. And I would shyly say things like, I, I think I'm transgender too. And I would be told, no, you know, you meet trans men and you just know they already look like men. Um, or I'd be told that because I show my emotions easily or I get excited and I flail a little bit with my hands fluttering that uh, that proved I wasn't a man. Um, or one of the big growing digital communities for queer and trans spaces was the social networking site Tumblr. Requiescat in pace. And that I found those spaces to be deeply toxic for me. Um, I was like slightly older than the average set that that site catered to. Um, so I was in early 20s and that was 15 to 20 as the primary you know, dominant social group. Um, 
and so I'd, I'd run into a lot of like, queer purity testing. I don't know how to explain it really without sounding like I'm an old fogey who doesn't like these kids. And like, no, I, I like kids just fine. And I think the, the kids of today are pretty great, but I'm not explaining myself well here. It just wasn't a good community. And so I'd been sort of talked out of self-identity. Um, so yeah, it took a long time uh, to be able to confidently say, I am a trans person. Um, I don't think there was a single trigger that like locked it in for me. Um, you know, early on in my relationship with Kat, um, like aspects of that relationship helped me understand, but very little of the outside world um, gave me anything to latch onto to help self-identify. Um, and I honestly think I was only able to really start um, internalizing my identity when I had a supportive friend group who agreed to say, yes, you are a dude. Yes, I will use he um, and not tell me I was wrong. So that was really what my time in Richmond was for, as well as actually getting that darn degree. <laughs> um, which I just slammed through as fast as possible. I literally picked my major based on what will give me computer skills as fast as possible. So I, I essentially wanted to get um, graphic design skills, but the graphic design program at VCU is very well respected, very hardcore with a mandatory four years of study. So I looked at all of the courses for all of the programs tangentially related to design and found that the advertising degree featured a lot of the same classes, but I could get through it in two and a half years. And I didn't exactly have money. So advertising it is. Um, when did you decide you wanted to get a graduate degree? So I was working in Barnes and Noble and I had developed a dedicated customer base who would come to me specifically for um, advice and questions about uh, queer topics. Specifically, I had a small cadre of mothers of trans and queer kids who would come to me looking for books and resources uh, about those topics. And so um, like it was, it was a really great time. Um, I felt valued as a person and for my ability to help people. Uh, I really loved being in that role. And one day, one of I found out that one of that cadre of mothers was a librarian on uh, at the um, Cabell Library on VCU campus. And she said, you'd make a really good librarian. And I said, that would be sweet. I'd love to be a librarian. How does one be a librarian? And she said, you know what you should do? You should go talk to the head librarian and do a professional interview. And I said, that sounds cool. And so she hooked me up with the head librarian at the time. And I went in with a notebook and I said, I want to be a librarian. How be a librarian? Uh, and uh, she said, well, first you need a degree. I said, what? I just got a degree. <laughs> and I found out that, oh, this is, this is a legit hardcore profession with a specialized knowledge set. And I said, well, I guess I have to go get another degree. Um, and that was, I, that also was spurred by the fact that um, one of my only two friends from high school just died in a car wreck. And that wrecked me for a while. Um, and 
I was passed over for a promotion at the Barnes and Noble and my rent had gone up. And so we were starting to spiral living in Richmond. And so I, I researched all of the library programs in the United States and looked at respect versus financial commitment. And uh, Kat and I decided, I guess we're moving to North Carolina then. So. And uh, you decided specifically on the UNCG program? Yes. Um, so I looked at, you know, the, the, the rankings that you do. Um, and UNCG was always in the mix. Um, I think I did the early thing of conflating UNC and UNCG as well. Um, but I'd also spent some time in Greensboro as a kid with my mother. She did some student teaching in Greensboro for a while. Um, but I had fond memories of North Carolina. I didn't want to be quite as coastal as, as um, UNC because I, she had gone to UNC for some of her undergraduate work and I had hated living in Chapel Hill, Carborough area. area. Um, but whatever, but I wanted to be closer to the mountains that were you know, beautiful and attractive and whatnot. Um, also UNCG would not be as expensive. Um, and it seemed like a cooler town, frankly. Um, I, I looked up to make sure that it actually had a gay community at all. I saw that it had a gay community center or a gay club anyway. Um, and I drove through the town and saw that the sign for Geeksboro was going in and it was right beside Acme Comics. And so I thought, okay, there are gay people here. There are nerds here. And I actually see black people on the streets. This might be okay. And there are trees. I like trees. There are no trees in Raleigh. Raleigh sucks. Were you aware of um, UNCG's reputation as being a gay-friendly campus? Yes, I, I only looked at schools that were explicitly queer-friendly or rated as such. Mind you, I was suspicious of this because in Virginia, Virginia Tech, the college that fired me for being gay, was also very highly rated as queer-friendly to students. So I've always been, uh, since then anyway, very suspicious of those ratings. And I've had a very clear understanding that the experience of front facing and back of house are different entities. Um, so even once I was on UNCG campus, I found myself constantly looking at employees and staff members in say lower roles, lower, quote marks, um, and seeing how they interacted with each other, how tired or angry they looked all the time. So I, I always have that consciousness in the back of my mind. How did we score in your book? <laughs> well, I went to UNCG, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I saw people having con conversations with each other. Um, I saw that like cashiers would laugh and converse with students. So I could tell that there was some, you know, cross pollination and communication between those levels uh, or status of people. And you know, that, that was good. Um, now at first I couldn't dive into UNCG right away uh, because I was from out of state and I could not afford out of state tuition. So I had to live and work in North Carolina for a year before I was allowed to be a student. So I asked for a transfer from my Barnes and Noble and they transferred me to the Barnes and Noble on UNCG campus. And now I'm gonna get spicy. Go for it. <laughs> the only position they had open at my full-time supervisor pay 
was in the cafe. So instead of books, I was in food service, which was not great. But worse, the manager, who I'm going to guess is still there, is hella racist. The only other employees were black women and attractive black women. I found out during hiring processes um, that I would get to interview all of the people who weren't attractive women, conventionally attractive women. Um, so yeah, he would only hire black women or really cute girls, but they moved on quickly because they had better options. Uh, mind you, I knew this was messed up because the bookstore portion had the more usual mix of people. Like they, they were, they, they, it was diverse over in the bookstore portion, but on the line for drink making, just black women. And the occasional man, but just one at a time. You know, you have to have someone competent now. And then. It was hell. It was absolute hell. Um, but I got through it. I worked there a year. And made it into schooling. And finally, once at UNCG, and once I was in school, you know who I made friends with while I worked at the cafe? Who? Jim Carmichael. Oh, I was hoping he would pop up. <laughs> and he is part of what kept me hanging on because he would come through and he was beautiful, wearing the clothes I wanted to wear, being the man I wanted to be. And I would tell him, I'm working here so I can work, so I can go to school for library studies. And he would just be his darling self and and gave me enough um hope and excitement to hold on for another month so that i owe a lot to that man um so yes but once finally actually in the program i was able to get a really cool assistantship um, and that paid me more than I had ever made in my life. It, it was like I was winning a lottery. I was able to move into an apartment where Kat wasn't sick all the time or less sick all the time. Um, the, the previous one was a, a studio apartment with no doors, a front door, but no, no differentiation of rooms. Um, with so many cockroaches such big cockroaches and of course he's allergic to cockroaches particularly um and like sparks came out of the wall all the time it it had um fuses instead of um the switch box what's the word slippers breakers breakers there we go so yeah it had screw in fuses and uh, fabric covered wires that frequently went off and caught on fire. It was, it was not a good place. <sighs> but um, I would, I would say that the first year at UNCG was my happiest year ever. And my second year at UNCG was my most hellish year ever. Um, which was just because I was so afraid of having to go back and not getting a job and just having to go back to poverty. I can't quite elucidate the terror of poverty. It's, it's not like being afraid of being hit by a car or being afraid that someone you love is hurt. It's, it is bigger because it is longer. Um, and, and I still have like a lot of hangups about poverty. I have a whole lot of shame 
uh, even while at UNCG, whenever there were um, like cool professional uh, talks and meet and greets with authors and everyone around was academia and all of the conversations were really cool and interesting. All I could think about was they'll be able to tell that I'm not one of them. And it's not even because of being queer because academia is, is wonderfully queer. But I knew that people could tell that I was poor and had not easily made it into these circles. And I'm, and I'm sure that everybody has their own specific uh, troubles and struggles in getting to where they want to be. I, I know the climb's not easy for everyone. But it was still upsetting all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm still not over it. And part of that's because I'm still attached to a grant and I know that at the time ending of the grant, <laughs> there's still a chance. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so talking a little bit more about your time in the Greensboro area, um, how did you find the LGBTQ climate in Greensboro as a whole? Medium. Um, almost all of the people I met and befriended are part of the community. Um, just by natural wandering around, um, which was great. Like I didn't, I didn't have to look at all for my people. Um, it's just that everyone I happened to talk to, um, was. The biggest anchor in Greensboro for me was Geeksboro. Um, Geeksboro Coffee House and Thwarted Cinema. And I understand Geeksboro is no longer around. And I also kind of watched the semi-public meltdown of its owner uh, from a distance with horror and disappointment. But prior to that, the location served as a wonderful meeting ground for all the weirdies that I could ever hope to you know, hang out with. Uh, most significantly, in the back room, I found the meeting of the SCA, the Society for Creative Anachronism, which is an international educational nonprofit society dedicated to the study and recreation of the Middle Ages with more plumbing and less racism. Not no racism, just less. Uh, and that became like my primary a hobby and community. And everyone in the local branch was also very queer, which was delightful. And more importantly, from different generations. So old people, middle-aged people, my age people, and even a couple younger people. So it was really exciting to find out that there were older queer people they exist too. You you can grow up and still be queer. Um, because you know one of the great tragedies of being the G's, the B's, the T's, etc., um, is that you don't have an, a a direct line to your ancestry. Um, and I hadn't really had elders up till that point. So. So you mentioned the SCA, which kind of um, has a gender divide in some. No of kidding. <laughs> and you're going in as trans. Uh huh. So how how you said that the local chapter was was friendly, but there's also like the national organization, right? Yeah, yeah. So currently, like in in my day to day now, I'm. I am a DEI activist in the SCA at like the national level. It's, it's like one of the things that I do, try to sort of work against the goals of many portions of that group. Um, so when I went in, I was pre-transition um, and I was still trying to say, 
I am a trans man. Please be nice to me and call me the right thing. I'm still nervous. And most people would do so instantly. New people would misgender me. There was one particularly terrible time where I got called into court. Uh, we, we, we held court. People get awards for doing acts of service like event planning or making really cool art or being the best at hitting each other with sticks. And I got called into court to be given an award because I presented as female. One of the gentlemen in the audience leapt up to escort me into court uh, as a gender culture thing. And that was very awkward and upsetting for me. Um, the people who knew that I was male laughed at him because of the gender tomfoolery this created. Oh, uh, and there's there's like just a lot of nonsense infighting about gender. Like the one of the the conventions is that in most kingdoms, uh, that being the state-ish level um, of of organization. Um, kingship, queenship is passed by uh, who fights good in sword combat. As you might imagine, this is heavily gendered. Uh, there have been queens who have won directly, uh, but they're rare. Um, this obviously is also intensely ableist. So, so yeah, there, there are deep problems. And it bothers me, yes, that my hobby is so messed up in these ways. Um, and right now, I'm in the, I'm going to try and fix my hobby. I may eventually say, to hell with it. I can find better hobbies. I know I could find better hobbies, but right now, for some reason, I've decided to try and throw my head against this brick wall. Um, but I will say that it's definitely a different experience playing locally versus trying to play at higher levels because the higher levels are more deeply systemic like they're, they're, they're much more dependent on the structure that's expected. Whereas the local is, we meet up at this coffee shop and we spin on spinning wheels and talk about history, um, which I can def definitely get into. That's great. Um, and we had several trans people, uh, we, several pillars were very gay like openly gay um, in the local set. So the local set was very welcoming and excellent. Um, when I got my award of arms, which is like the award of uh, congratulations, you are recognized as being a consistent player in our group. Um, I was made Lord instead of Lady. And the SCA in more recent years has added a official uh, agendered statement of armager. Uh, you, you get to add to your name comma armager. Um, and there's a group that is adding more terms from um, non-Western Europe cultures that are also acceptable, like uh, Dana and um, Thane is a good one. So. And what span of years were you in Greensboro? I think that was 2011 to, two. well, it had to have been four years. So I guess 2015. Okay, so you- No, no, I was there for the trumpeting, so 2016. Okay, so you were here for HB2 as well. Uh, actually, here's the thing. I decided on moving to, to North Carolina and, and Greensboro, and the day, the day I moved down, there was a vote on HB2. And honestly, 
at that moment, I just kind of, I was so depressed. Like, again, my, my best friend had just died. Um, I had just moved not out of a joy and excitement, but out of a poverty desperation spiral. spiral. Um, I didn't know if I could hack it. Um, and the, the guy who let us into our apartment was being very friendly. And he said, well, it's a, it's a nice town, but you can, you can walk down to downtown and it's, there's lots of good shops down there, but you got to be careful because after dark, well, that's when the blacks come out. So I wasn't feeling great. <laughs> um, so I didn't exactly feel welcomed on the state level. Uh, but it's not like where I'd come from was worse, you know? This is before um, Virginia flipped blue. And in Richmond, well, Richmond is still very aware that it was the capital of the Confederacy. <laughs> uh, I'd been in a court case for stalking, um, based around race, like it, HB2 is bad, but it wasn't functionally worse for me. And I was honestly glad that it was so bad that it was getting national notice because then people would actually care that anything needed work. Um, and Looking back on it, yeah, I think that was probably the trigger to um, having trans rights and trans issues be in the public sphere at all. Um, I've had to do a lot less prior to HB2. I would meet people who didn't know that trans men could exist. That like people had a concept of trans women or thought that transgender people or using any other terms were just trans women. But I, I think HB2 and particularly the activism against HB2, which uh, some of the best of which tended to be like very mask presenting trans men uh, taking photos of themselves in women's bathrooms asking like, do I belong here? Um, which while on academic you know, review might have like layers of problematics, but in terms of advertising, we're very effective at communicating some of the issues of having gendered restrooms uh, with legal backing anyway. Mm -hmm. so, so honestly, I think I appreciated HB2 more than I hated it in a really messed up way. Um, at what point did you physically transition? So prior to uh, where I live now, I did not have the financial ability or any kind of health support for that. So one, I didn't have any insurance. Um, and then with, until, until Obamacare, and then I didn't have usable insurance. Um, I, I had like, you know, if you die insurance, um, but I didn't have any way to seek transition care. There were no queer medical facilities closer than Asheville, so far as I knew or could find. And um, Asheville's were locked down to the surrounding Buncombe County area. Uh, I had a friend in Asheville who got their uh, hormones from Planned Parenthood, and that was great for them. Couldn't do anything for me. Our Planned Parenthood didn't do it. Um, so I was not able to even begin transitioning until I moved to Illinois, where there's a plethora of options. I'm near Chicago, so in fact, after this meeting, 
I'm gonna go get my labs done at Howard Brown, which is a specifically LGBTQ plus healthcare uh, organization and is incredible. I don't have to pay for anything. They're great. <laughs> um, uh, but North Carolina didn't have those options at all for me. Um, um, as you were transitioning and in the workforce, uh, was there a was there any tension in how your coworkers uh, interacted with you during that process? So my first job in which I was like really out would have been on the uh, Good Medicine Project under David and Jennifer, um, which was, you know, sh chest shakingly scary. Um, but I felt that if ever I was going to try, now was the right time because, uh, uh, not to not to be rude, but I assumed that Mr. Gwynn was openly part of the community, and I might find some um, solidarity, some support there, and thankfully I did. Uh, it was my very best employment experience, um, probably still. <laughs> it was great. Uh, um, I couldn't really tell how others responded one way or the other. Oh, my cow. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't have like deep connection with anybody else there. Can't down. Please pardon me one second. Oh, that's all right. Down. <laughs> Sorry. The pets are an obligatory part of these interviews. We found oh, okay. of them, so I'm, so they're quite welcome. Oh, good. <laughs> He's just being a butt because he wants attention. Um. So I don't know how other people responded to me. I was afraid to find out one way or the other. So I tried not to be like assertively trans at people. <laughs> not in or out of the closet necessarily, just sort of there. Um, so I, I didn't really um, stand up for like my pronouns or anything, um, but I did see that uh, David and Jennifer would correct people. And that meant the freaking world to me. That, you know, gave me enough oomph that when I had the access to actually begin transitioning. Um, because while I was in Greensboro, in addition to there not being any resources, I remember very much feeling the, well, it's kind of good that there aren't any resources because if there were, I'd have to actually decide to transition. Um, and then the only reason that I wasn't transitioning would be my own fault. And I wasn't sure yet because you know, actively pursuing being different would be very hard. And I knew that there was going to be a period of time where I was this horrific monster amalgamation of male and female with a beard and huge breasts. And yeah, I am that and it's fine. It's, it's fine. <laughs> All right. So you you kind of touched on this a bit earlier when you were talking about the gatekeeping in the trans community. Um, and we presently have a lot of trans representation in the media, in various forms of media. So in TV shows and movies, we have Caitlyn Jenner running for... Oh. So this uh, image of the trans community that is being conveyed <laughs> um, to a lot of people who may not be familiar enough with the trans community to know that that may not be representative. Can you speak to that? Uh, sort of like HP2. 
at least this means people who have no clue have learned some sort of anchor points to springboard off of for their learning. Um, I've actually had more fights about Caitlyn Jenner in trans communities than I have outside of, in that I, I encounter people who dislike Caitlyn Jenner for like giving the trans people a bad name. And so I'll, I'll encounter people like misgendering Caitlyn Jenner. And I'll have to be like, no, no, we, we can hate her for other reasons. We don't need to reenact our own violence. Um, so if that's been a weird thing, um, some trans representation has been amazing, like, uh, Elliot Page coming out. That was wonderful, incredible, um, to have somebody who is, um, yeah, trans mask, number one, um, which is in very short supply in popular culture media um, for somebody who is, has a very good golden reputation is not hashtag problematic. <laughs> Watch, now he's gonna go do something stupid, but for now, we all love Elliot Page, it is in a major popular series and is transitioning on screen. That's incredible. Don't really care for the show, but whatever. It's great, <laughs> fine. Um, so I'm, I'm real hype about that. Um, I understand Pose was very well regarded. Um, I, I don't really key into that style of, of queer media, um, but I, I'm happy for it. Um, like, like I get it, most of the, the, the popular culture representation ain't great. But some is good. And what's important to me is that there just be more total, more variety total, so that the general public doesn't get the impression of, oh, that's exactly what a trans person is. Because um, then they can at least get five types of trans people, which allows them, I think, to add more, more easily. Oh. So in general, as long as the arc improves overall, then I think it's fine. I think we're doing better. Um, obviously, that could go back down. But I see, in general, more trans people playing trans characters, which is great. Um, I've seen a few cis women playing trans women, which is fine, I think. I'm seeing fewer cis men play trans women, which is better. And even I got hit with the casting call for uh, Pixar looking for uh, a young trans person. Well, the phrasing on the casting call is, can authentically play a transgender 14-year-old girl, which is slightly suspect. But I think what they're going for is having a young trans person play this character. Uh, so it was exciting not only that they are hiring for a trans story out of a major kids uh, media site, uh, company, but that they were clued in enough to actual trans spaces that I, as a trans person, saw it. Um, like the day it came out. And I think it hit like major media the next day. So I, I still think that they hit the right places first. So. Um, so across the nation we have a lot of anti-trans legislation going on yeah. and of course if you're connected to social media you're going to be inundated with mm -hmm. this which seems like it would very much be like a constant attack um every day you open up facebook twitter or whatever mm -hmm. um 
can you speak to how you deal with that? So the path my life has taken me on, I have become of a, a, a kind of a hardcore activist and an educator on queer topics. Um, so I try to act as a, as, as a kinder voice to people who don't know better. And I try to be very aware of what distinguishes a good faith argument or question from just terrible human beings. And in my social media, um, I consume it very intentionally. And I have, I have a very liberal block and defriend policy. So I do not have um, much in the way of passive, troublesome uh, material. So I, I don't have as much of the experience of opening up social media and getting hit with a relative being a butthead or uh, uh, disingenuous news stories um, because I've cultivated my follows to be also very activist. I, I am very proud of my intensely leftist bubble. Uh, I've worked hard to achieve it. Um, and so I seek my news through news sources rather than passively being hit with it as they come. Um, so each, probably twice a week, I look up you know, what bills have been put forth in all the state legislatures. There's a pretty decent website that I have bookmarked that lists all trans-related bills in each state, uh, good or bad, mostly bad. Um, and then I'll try to do, sometimes I'll do like a general informational post, um, and this will get picked up mostly by well-meaning, new to social justice activities, white people, and shared semi-well for, you know, me just being a non-media personality. Um, and so that's how I try to approach, um, the news and by taking this kind of active controlling role i guess i feel less helpless slightly there are definitely some days where i just die inside and <sighs> go have some hot cocoa and watch youtube videos that are by angry communists and make me feel better but you know i i try to be functional first. Um, I have the benefit of having almost no living family, so I don't have racist Uncle Paul or whatever. Uh, it's, I, I don't have anyone to worry about. My mother sobered up and decrazied. She's doing great. Um, my father has been a rock through the whole thing. Uh, they are both you know, very much old school liberals. Um, Sometimes kind of cringy, but that's fine. Let, let them be old people. It's fine. Um, so I think that's generally how I handle it, yeah. Um, so what, these oral histories are frequently incorporated into class assignments where students will read the oral, oral history as part of learning about UNCG history and Greensboro history and LGBTQ history. So there may be, uh, and very likely will be queer students at various points in their lives, potentially looking at this oral history and learning about you and your life. Is there anything you'd like to say to those students, both maybe next semester or 10 years from now? Yes. Travel even if it costs money, even if you don't have money, because it's different in other places. It doesn't mean it's gonna be better or worse, but it's at least different. Um, I've traveled throughout the Southeast and I thought I was well-traveled for that region, but the cultural differences from being uh, there to being in Illinois are vastly different. Um, 
I am more instantly welcomed as a trans person and as of my real identity, regardless of whether I have the beard or not. Um, there's still racism. There's still there's still all the isms, but they're a different flavor, and I can handle this bullshit better. Probably shouldn't cuss. Sorry. You're welcome to do so. Thank you. And and it it definitely seemed impossible to move. There were lots of things standing in the way. But in the end, you just have to do it. So if it isn't working here, go elsewhere. All right. Is there anything you would like to talk about that we have not covered in the Sun Review? I'll tell you a really funny story about being at UNCG in my library degree. I was working at the uh, Teaching Resources Center, um, which is the, the little model school library uh, over in the School of Education building, uh, just running circulation desk. And one of my classmates from collection development class came in. And I had, I had been like publicly like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm heckin' gay. Um, and so my, this guy comes in and he's complaining about something or other. And he ends up saying, well, I, I guess that guy's really attractive, but you wouldn't know, would you? I said, yeah, I think he's really attractive. And he said, wait, but I thought you were a, a, a lesbian. And I'm like, well, no, I'm a trans man. Um, and he says, what? Well, I thought that your spouse, because he'd met my spouse, was a, a woman. So are you straight? Then why do you still like this man? And so I, I explained that we are both trans men. We are both non-straight. Um, and he got confused for a minute and I'm all prepared to do the teaching thing. I, I know all the questions that are gonna happen and I, I, I'm ready. But he says, so you like men and women? Yes. And you're a man? Yes. Which of our classmates do you think gives the best blowjobs? And <laughs> I, I was flabbergasted. And all I could think was plus 10 points for immediate acceptance but minus a thousand for hella misogyny, man. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I did not respond other than to say, I don't think I can answer that. I know that I should have said, well, that's absolutely unforgivable. You, you cannot say such things, but I, I was just, uh, could not, could not handle. Are there any other interesting UNCG or Greensboro stories you can think of? There are so many, um, but I think that one encapsulates the, the general mode of experiences <laughs> that I tended to have. Um, All right. Uh, David, did you have any questions? Would you ever come back here? Um, I would come back to work for UNCG, but I would not come back for anything else. Um, I, I loved my time at UNCG very much, um, but I don't like the South on a governmental level. I really like living in a blue state. I, I like having health care. It's, it's real nice. Okay. Um, well, thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you for your project. I'm very glad to have this resource available as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. I'm going to stop the recording.